Hello and welcome to this best practices in software series. We'll begin with a high level here, and as the series continues, we'll get into more specific areas. First, we'll begin with an introduction, look at some of the inspiration and motivation for why best practices are important, and then we'll step through some of the major areas of best practices. This includes the principles, standards, patterns, frameworks, and finally architectures that embrace a lot of the thinking and the practices that go into making your software scalable and maintainable. And then we'll wrap things up. Now, during the course of this video, if you like what you see and you want to learn more, there's lots of resources I have available for myself and also from around the internet to share. You can check out this link here to see articles, different repos that are embracing these practices, as well as tips specifically for certain game platforms. My name is Samuel Asher Ravello. I'm a Unity certified developer with over 20 years of game dev experience. My mission is to educate and entertain with interactive technology, including games, and I've shipped game titles for lots of different platforms, including those listed here. My development experience spans lots of different technologies, including a decade or so focusing in the Unity game engine for console, mobile, PC, and Steam specifically. I've also done lots of educational work online and in person with different online learning platforms, as well as at university levels. A few of the courses that I have available on demand right now are 2D game design with Unity and other specific areas within Unity and game development. You can check them out, links below. Continuing the courses available and a few that are very interesting for best practices include MVC architecture for Unity, as well as unit testing for C Sharp and Unity. Let's look at some of the inspiration or motivation for using best practices. Each time we sit down to create a new piece of software, we have a blank slate. All the frustrations of past projects where projects eventually became perhaps unscalable or difficult to maintain, we can put those into the background and start fresh here with a new idea. Especially with a tiny scope starting on the first days and weeks of a project, you may not recognize the future problems that are coming down the road. Slowly you add more and more code and you connect those code and sometimes the cheap and easy way, however, it just gets done. Also, many teams embrace a prototype first development model where you throw out any best practices and you just try and test out different user experience features. Now, prototyping is fantastic, but one of the major problems is many teams continue to live forever in their prototype code base instead of throwing it away, which is my recommendation. So our code, thrown together in sometimes a quick and dirty way, whether it started as a prototype or not, you begin to have what looks like a big ball of spaghetti in how your code is organized and interrelated, or perhaps not organized would be a better way to say. And with more and more time, this blank slate that you had at the beginning of the project with the added complexity of new features, change requests, could become an unmanageable mess. Every decision we make be it technology, process, or people, can be viewed as a form of investment. Investments come with a cost, and we trust that they will pay off. From this perspective, I look at the best practices as an investment in your project and your team. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. This perspective makes me think of the humanity in the software development process. While of course the instructions we're writing are being interpreted, compiled, and used by computers, we are on a team, a team of one even, where it's important for us to be able to read, understand, and add to our own code base. Of course, with the added communication challenges of working with a team, perhaps across different locations, Having your code organized in the best way and following these practices we'll see will help there as well. And as Kent Beck says, I'm not a great programmer. I'm just a good programmer with great habits. Here we're reminded of the discipline it takes and the habit forming that's needed for excellence in software development. Now, many developers feel like work is all about adding new features. And they unfortunately focus on adding those features quickly like I mentioned with the prototyping example. However, this short-sighted vision is counterproductive. Research shows that 80% of development bugs come from just 20% of the features. This means that core complexity often sits in a narrow corner of the code base. 
and having bad project organization can cause tremendous reoccurring issues. Also, 80% of developer time is maintaining the code base. It's not adding the features, it's living with those features. So maintainable code pays dividends over that larger time frame. Early bug detection and productive bug resolution is more important than just adding features quickly. And the cost of catching and resolving software bugs increases over time. If we identify a bug in the design and architecture phase, it's much easier and quicker for us to resolve. As the implementation, testing, showing our project to their customers, and finally releasing it, as those steps advance, catching that same bug later on is much, much more costly. So best practices will help us create maintainable code. We'll also have the ability to increase the amount of automation and testing that we do around our code. This will all help us catch bugs early and often, and it's a good practice to fix your bugs before you add a new feature. Let's take a look at software best practices. Some of the terms related to software best practices are listed here, including refactoring, decoupling, dry, design patterns. And as you advance in your career, in the ladder of professional development, you begin with things like classes and object-oriented programming. You begin to level up that knowledge, increasing modularity and abstraction, and adding familiarity with testing and expertise in architecture. Now imagine the path from a junior developer over the course of your career to some more advanced positions with added responsibility. It is particularly important for having best practices experience in those later phases of your career. And that's because in the beginning of your career, while best practices are just as important, you are following others in how they set up the team. Whereas with the added responsibility that comes with more senior positions, you are expressing leadership to your team, making these decisions on best practices for your people and your process affecting the product. These best practices lead to better software. Here we see some of the major categories. Let's step through each of them. We see that these categories of best practices build upon each other. So first we have principles, and with a good understanding of those, we're able to apply standards, bringing that into the patterns that we use, eventually building frameworks, and finally architectures for our projects. Within principles, you may be familiar with dry, KISS, and solid. In standards, we talk about project structure, how we set up our code, and making purposeful processes that we live within. Design patterns include ways to create, modify the behavior, and set up the structure of your code. And some examples of frameworks include event bus, state machine, and behavior tree. And for large concepts like architectures, which can help set up the majority of your code base, include model view controller and service. The term dry or don't repeat yourself is a casual way to encourage code reusability and avoid redundancy in your code base. For example, you can take a look at the snippet here and see that there's some elements that are copy and pasted across the code base. And by centralizing and applying dry, we're able to limit the amount of redundancy we have in the code base, so it's easier to read and easier to maintain this code. You may also be familiar with the term KISS, which is keep it simple and keep it stupid, or keep it simple, stupid. Simplifying your code to make it more understandable and maintainable. Here's a purposely complex method with some added stuff just to simulate some of the complexity that you might consciously or subconsciously be adding into your code base. When really keeping it simple is just about getting down to the heart of what each method needs to do and not worrying about other details that are unrelated. This could also be some temporary debugging code that you don't wanna leave in your code base. You wanna strip that out. A fundamental design principle is called the solid design principle where each letter of the word solid refers to one of these principles we see listed here. Now, it's a really big subject matter you wanna jump into and get deeper into, especially looking at some code samples. I'm not gonna cover it all today, but you can see, for example, in the first one, it's about a single responsibility. So each area of your code base, perhaps a method, should have exactly one reason to change, which is a way to say that a method should do just one thing, and a class should do just one area of functionality. By splitting your code base up this way, you're able to have it be more maintainable and more readable. When looking at design standards, there's a few areas that stand out to me. 
Project structure is organizing your files and folders to support the solution that you have in mind. Coding standards are about consistent naming, formatting, and commenting in how you do your code. Now, if you're on a team of one, these principles are still gonna help you to lay down your first code in a more logical way, consistent with your larger vision. And especially on teams where you all get together and agree on what your coding standards should be, you're able to get more buy-in and have each area of your code base be more interchangeable so staff can step in, understand, and modify each area without necessarily a bottleneck or a dependency on another person. And having a purposeful process here, scoping out the estimations of your work, doing things like design reviews and code reviews, documenting your code, and looking back on how the last one week or last one month went for the team is very powerful. You can also consider adding automation into this part of the workflow, doing things like testing manually and automatically throughout your code base. Now, like a lot of best practices, the more your team is able to lean on these as effective ways to set up your project, the easier it is to onboard new staff and offboard staff that may be switched to a different team. There's more shared knowledge and more understanding which will facilitate that communication. Design patterns are not specific lines of code, they're more common solutions to common programming problems. There's three major categories, and we see as developers creating solutions today, we're probably not reinventing the wheel in much of our code base. So we can lean on ways to create new objects, to manage the object interaction or the behavior, and also ways to compose our structures so that we're able to set up relationships between the areas of our code base in a way that's proven to work well. And building on top of patterns, we have design frameworks. Design frameworks are a structured approach to streamline development. Often I think about this in a subsystem scope. Now remember the analogy of kind of the waterfall where each of these concepts is building upon each other. So everything we've covered in the recent areas here in the slides is leading up to the design frameworks. Some examples of design frameworks are an event bus, a state machine, and a behavior tree. And finally, bringing all of this together, we have design architectures. This is having a structured approach at the project level scope. So how do you sit down and lay down your entire code base or a large majority of your code base? One time tested and popular approach is model view controller service. This regards breaking your code base up into four major areas where the model is about storing your data, but it doesn't handle any functionality. The view is just about displaying things to your user and taking input back from your user. The controller is probably where most of the lines of your code would live. This is the behavior logic that takes these other concerns and brings them together like glue and adds the actual behavior that you want. And finally, the service layer is about managing any external communication to your game or application. This can be things like communicating, reading, writing to the back end, or reading, writing to local files. And the design principles, and in particular design architectures, is a way for us to get away from that spaghetti code mess that we saw earlier and have things laid out into the different areas that we talked about so it's more easy to know when I'm adding new code in which area I should put it, how those areas should be composed and communicate together. If that sounds interesting to you and you'd like to dig deeper and you wanna learn more, you can take a look at this course that I have available now, the links below. This is about MVC communication and architecture specifically for Unity. You can also apply this to other areas of software development as well, but all of the examples you'll see included there are specific to the challenges of working with MVC inside Unity game development. You can see lots of the different course content that we have there. Just a bit of feedback on this. Uh, one user said, I highly recommend this course to improve knowledge about design patterns. So a lot of the design patterns that we saw previously in the slide deck, we can take a look at there in the course. And then another user said, I didn't expect the MVC architecture to be used in Unity. And it's often not used in many game teams. But when you wanna scale up and do it well, I highly recommend looking at one of the off-the-shelf solutions and really leaning on its strengths. So taking a look at this course will help you formulate why MVCS is or isn't right for you. And along the way, you'll learn a lot of different principles that you can apply in even custom solutions that you create for your own games. Another related course I have is about unit testing for Unity. 
We're gonna cover unit testing fundamentals. There's workshops in there as well as lessons even getting into what's called CICD or being able to have every time you push a commit to your version control, kicking off some automated processes that will automatically report back to you if it finds any errors. Fantastic setup and really a way to keep you focused on creating new features so that the system you've got here will really help find and detect those bugs. And here's just some of the feedback on that course, very in-depth and polished, so I'm very happy to hear that. And the other student here said, some of the examples were a bit simplistic, but good for learning. I really try to start early and simple in these fundamentals and showcase kind of an A to Z approach. In summary here, let's take a look at what we've covered. We looked at inspiration for how and why we should think about investing in our software practices. We looked at specifically principles, standards, all the way up through the patterns, frameworks, and talked a little bit about architecture there. And we're wrapping it up here. So thanks very much for your time. Again, lots of links and resources below for you to get deeper. And also, we're going to continue this series and get more specific into some of these topics. Thanks.